Chuckle. Cool. Hey everyone, it's Nux, and welcome back to another installment of my review series where I give my own personal input and critique about a game I finished. And for this episode, we'll be taking a look at the latest 2D adventure for Sega's Blue Lord and Savior, Sonic Superstars, a game that I had a very clear first impression towards, to put it lightly. As many people who follow my channel know by now, I haven't been enthusiastic when it comes to 2D and Sonic the Hedgehog, because while I'm a very big fan of 2D Sonic, since its gameplay is what really made me fall in love with gaming as a whole, the way Sega has gone about handling it for the longest time now has annoyed me to no end, which I've explained in countless previous videos, so I'm not going to re-explain that all here. But I need to bring up some of those thoughts because it's very relevant to how I felt upon just the mere announcement of this game, as it looked to be continuing a lot of the things I dislike when it comes to the current direction of 2D Sonic. Firstly, it's no secret that I was really hoping for a game that follows the footsteps of the modern style 2D Sonic games, such as the Sonic Advance games or Sonic Rush games, so that it can finally make Sega commit to putting classic Sonic as a concept behind everyone, and really give a fresh new Sonic experience that didn't feel uninspired in too many areas for me. Because as much as I do love 2D Sonic, and even the classic form of 2D Sonic, I am sick of classic Sonic as an individual character and aesthetic. Because whenever they heavily lean on it, they portray Sonic in his most basic form, and hold back the potential of the gameplay, story, and other elements for no reason other than it wasn't like that in the classic Sonic games, so it shouldn't be here. The modern portrayal of this classic Sonic character annoys me because it just feels like a cheap imposter of the true energy to what classic Sonic was, boiling it down to the nostalgic elements of the Sonic series alone and not fully understanding what in the classic games actually made Sonic into an icon and how those elements evolved going into the games where he was redesigned and brought into the third dimension. But whenever I explain this, it starts wildfires, and Sega is convinced that Classic Sonic alone is a moneymaker. So of course, Sonic Superstars was looking to be yet another basic 2D Sonic game that continues all those issues for me. But there was an even bigger concern that I had going into this game which is that I feared for its general quality immediately because of the fact that I didn't expect this game to be an improvement from Sonic Mania, the previous 2D Sonic installment. Because while it annoyed the hell out of me how much of Sonic Mania relied on past Sonic content, the game was extremely polished and fun, thanks to the passionate work of Christian Whitehead and his team. It actually felt like an evolution to 2D Sonic gameplay, instead of an enormous step back. And it made me excuse a lot of the smaller issues I had with that game. So if we were going to get another classic Sonic game that is basically just like Mania, but with entirely new zones or even a different set of retro zones, then I could maybe at least enjoy this game from a gameplay standpoint, which is the most important thing for a video game at the end of the day. But with Superstars, I did not remotely believe that would be the case here, because not only did we know Christian Whitehead was not returning, but the game was looking to be another 2.5D Sonic game, like Sonic the Hedgehog 4, with 2D gameplay that's more like what's seen within recent 3D Sonic games, which I always felt was inferior to a lot of the more purely 2D Sonic games, due to how Sega tries to recreate 2D Sonic gameplay in the most cheap, in poorly executed ways possible. And the more we learned, the more it just piled onto my instant dislike towards this game. Whether it be how similar to the very overused Green Hill Zone the first level looked, or how the game was looking to focus on multiplayer now, making me fear for the game being unfocused in level design and ending up a cheap knockoff to the new Super Mario Bros. games. 
or the final red flag for me, how the game was primarily being developed by Arzes, a team with such <coughs> amazing games under their belt like Balan Wonderworld and Yoshi's New Island. And all of that just blended together to make me have little to no optimism to cover this game. Just like with a game such as Sonic Frontiers, because I knew that I'd be repeating a lot of the same stuff I have for years and that I would not enjoy the game. But against all my drive to not even bother with this game, a friend hooked me up with a coffee. And in the end, I couldn't resist the temptation of covering the blue Lord and Savior once again. Because I felt like I owed this to the Sonic folks who follow this channel, since if it's gonna be who knows how long until the next 3D Sonic game again, then I'm probably not gonna say much about the series in a long minute, unless something else catches my eye. So I said fudge it, and dove into Sonic Superstars, not really knowing what to expect because of the inconsistency when it comes to Sonic the Hedgehog quality. So how did the game turn out? Well, let's get into it. Starting off with the gameplay, it's basically how 2D Sonic gameplay always is, and I don't think I need to explain how that all works to most of you by now. But the big thing I really feared for this game is the general control and polish of it, because of how there will be Sonic games that are mostly okay and polished, but there can also be games that are very unpolished. And with Sonic Superstars, it could have easily leaned into being another Sonic 4, where the gameplay isn't straight broken and full of glitches, but is just too stiff and absolutely unfaithful to how 2D Sonic should feel. But in this case, no. The game is mostly solid when it comes to the general control of how Sonic should feel. And this is because of the fact that while Christian Whitehead didn't have a big hand on this game directly, he passed over a lot of the coding and general gameplay build for how Sonic controlled in a game like Sonic Mania. So the general control is mostly fine still. Which, I still think it's a little lame how hopeless Sega seems to be in making a 2D Sonic game without the guy, but whether he is on good terms with Sega or not, or whether Sega and Arzus can make a good 2D Sonic on their own without him or not, right now I'm just glad that this coding put this particular game on the right track. But the elephant in the room a lot of Sonic fans ignore is that the game is still inferior to many other 2D Sonic games out there, whether that be the classic games themselves, Sonic Mania, various other fanmate projects out there, etc. This is not the best 2D Sonic can control and feel, in my opinion. And I know, people don't like comparisons when it comes to new Sonic the Hedgehog content, but the harsh truth is that these comparisons are made because the game is lacking in an area that other games do better. It's not said solely for the purpose of beating the game down, it's said because it shows how the game can improve. And in the case of Sonic Superstars, it is close to nailing the classic Sonic feel, but it just doesn't. The buttery smooth control in a game like Mania just works better for 2D Sonic. Especially when in my playthrough of this game, it had more unpolished moments than with my Sonic Mania one, which people can't write off because I experienced these moments while playing with friends and while literally live streaming. What? What? Y'all saw that, right? Y'all saw that white? What? I'm I know I'm not tripping. Y'all saw that, right? <laughs> Someone clip that, please. Yeah, y'all knew I was going to sneak that clip in here. But ignoring the general 2D Sonic gameplay, what new stuff does this game bring to the table? Well, one thing about this game that's noteworthy is how dynamic its level design can get sometimes. Between the 2.5D elements that will have Sonic switching between the foreground and background, 
The moments where you'll get sucked into a portal sometimes and get a chance to fill up on rings, bringing in rail grinding despite it being a classic 2D Sonic game, etc. That kind of stuff is the risky and interesting ideas I like to see Sega play around with, even if it's not always executed the best. Which gets into the fact that, yeah, sometimes the game's gimmicks for levels aren't all too great, because they can lean towards being more intrusive than fun. Such as this one section of speed jungle that puts you within a slow platforming section in the dark, with very little light, which is just a stupid idea for a Sonic game without a better way to balance it out. Or the hydraulic press thing in Press Factory that can bounce the characters up and down constantly, which gave me war flashbacks to Wacky Workbench back in Sonic CD. Ugh. Like, I don't hate every gimmick that this game does, but sometimes they'll be a, a bit too much. Not utilized enough, or they won't stand out because it's something that's been executed better in another game. Such as the rail grinding. <laughs> and another big issue with this game is that it removes some really cool 2D Sonic gameplay elements that Mania had for no real reason. Such as the elemental shields, or some other moves like the insta shield or super peel out. Which is a huge shame, because I feel like Mania really mastered balancing those items and moves with the general level design throughout the game. This is not to say that every gameplay element from previous Sonic games should always return, but with a lot of stuff Mania brought back in terms of Sonic's moveset, I feel like a lot of that stuff should be staple gameplay elements, unless what replaces it is truly innovative. And one of the big new additions to this game in terms of gameplay is the Chaos Emerald Powers, to where now for some reason, Every individual Chaos Emerald has its own unique ability tied to it. And this concept wasn't bad in theory, but the actual Emerald powers leave a lot to be desired. A lot of them are very situational throughout the entire game, outside times where the game will nudge you to use one. And even when there is a unique scenario you might want to use one, it's negated by the fact that you can just use the natural abilities of some of the playable characters to get what you want. For example, there's this plant one that can rise the characters up, a water one that can climb waterfalls, and one that can help you see invisible platforms to stand on. But none of that really matters when you could either climb up where you need to go with knuckles, or straight fly up there with tails. Some of the individual character abilities conflict with them, and it's why I've always prioritized introducing new Sonic characters with unique talents and playstyles, as opposed to one-trick powers like with a series such as Mario. Which on that note, it's obvious that these powers are kind of like a substitute for the Wisp, which makes my eyes roll a bit, but I definitely prefer the Emerald powers over the Wisp for sure. Just again, the execution could be far better. Especially with the menu, because I swear that thing is finicky as hell to control. That's not to say they were all useless or anything though, as I got a lot of use out of the burst and clone powers, since they helped cheese the more annoying platforming or boss sections in this game. Which, oh boy, wait till we get to the bosses. But yeah, overall the gameplay of this game is just okay. It's not terrible, it's far from perfect, so it just lands at okay. And that's not a bad thing on its own, but when we factor in that this is coming off a lot of Sonic games that can be better in this category, it just leaves me feeling very unimpressed with it. Next up is the presentation. And this is an area that Sonic Superstars especially gets a lot of flack in because we're coming off the amazing 2D sprite work of, again, Sonic Mania, which could look really amazing in some levels. Meanwhile, with this game, it has that standard 3D look to it, more so mimicking games like Sonic 4. And here's my thing. I don't think that a game leaning towards a more 3D style, even if it's a 2D platformer, is a bad thing. 
as I'm very open to a 2D game that tries to feel more modern and grand. If it's executed in a way, that looks really good. But in the case of Sonic Superstars, it very much leans towards a cheap and plastic look of 3D. To where sometimes it looks fine and passable, but in very specific moments it really stands out and makes the game feel dated already. Like, I'm sorry, some of the effects of this game look like straight up Play-Doh, and it's just not a good look. Which is why a lot of people miss traditional 2D sprites and backgrounds, because that visual style tends to age far better. Heck, the game had these cool skins for Sonic & Co that had this neat comic book style that the whole game could have benefited from leaning into. But stuff like that is apparently pre-order bonus content, so I was stuck with what we got by default, I guess. Again, if Sega feels that experimenting with a 3D look in 2D Sonic helps make it look more modern, I don't entirely hate that idea. But that point kinda falls flat when you execute it in the most low budget looking way possible and proceed to not have that modern mentality for other areas of the game. I guess on the plus side, the game mostly runs smoothly in terms of frame rate, and the only other weird thing I can think to bring up is how the load times can be weirdly long for a 2D Sonic game. But finally, I want to use this section to say that I am not a fan of the cutscenes for this game, as they not only feel a bit cheaper compared to ones in previous installments, but they don't even look as good as ones in the promotional animations. As I cannot stand this cutesy and stubby look for Sonic and his friends, it just does not feel Sonic, man. But we'll talk more about promotional stuff later. Now let's talk about the world of this game. And this is an area that I had great fear for my sanity when picking up this game. Because I was convinced that this game was going to follow the footsteps of a lot of recent Sonic games and make us play through some variant of Green Hill, Chemical Plant, Sky Sanctuary, and the usual repaint culprits again. But believe it or not, through some miracle, that is not the case. Because this game has all original zones this time, and I can't express enough how much that saved this game for me alone. Because even though the zones could be hit or miss with their gimmicks and the execution of their level design, at least they were new locations that weren't fully recycled out of weak budget, lack of imagination, or whatever stupid reason Sega has for spamming old zones. And I pretty much enjoyed running through them all too, mostly. There was no zone in of itself that felt like it was too short or too much of a chore. So I liked the general lineup here. The problem is that the zones in terms of their themes, environments, and even enemies at times can feel a bit uninspired. Cause you see, Sonic Superstars takes place on a new general location known as the North Star Islands. Which is cool because I love that kind of world building when it comes to individual Sonic games and it's an actual improvement over Mania for once because it actually allows for this game to feel like it has its own identity, instead of heavily relying on old places mostly. But the issue with these zones, and the general feel of North Star, is that they aren't too distinct enough to stand out. Because a lot of the levels in this place share many tropes with previous Sonic games, and the overall island doesn't get much elaboration on the unique identity of this location. For example, for most of the zones, you can very clearly see what other Sonic zone they're inspired by, such as Bridge Island taking cues from many past first Sonic levels, Pinball Carnival feeling like Casino Night and Carnival Night, Lagoon City feeling like Hydrocity Zone, or Hydro City Zone, but whatever, and San Sanctuary feeling like Sanopolis, etc. Like, a lot of these zones feel a bit too similar to past Sonic level tropes, and it makes them forgettable as a result, because I'd honestly rather play the original zones they're based on than these very basic coffee cats. And even when a zone doesn't have some past trope that it can be compared to, 
it feels like Sega executed the idea for the zone in the most basic and surface level way possible. Let's take Sky Temple, for example. I like the idea of taking a sort of wind theme stage, similar to Windy Valley, a zone that isn't overused, and blending it with an ancient temple type stage. But beyond that surface level idea, that's it. The zone has a cool tornado you go through, but that's it. There's no other really interesting set pieces that stand it out in my eyes, and the general look of the zone is exactly how you would expect it to look. A better stage born from mixing level themes would probably be Frozen Base Zone, because I think it's a cool idea to blend together snow and factory theme levels standing out with conveyor belts and the way you navigate through machinery and ice obstacles. But the best zone in terms of really feeling unique was probably the Cyber Station Zone, which could have easily felt generic given that Sonic isn't new to messing with weird virtual reality themed stages. But this zone executes it in a pretty neat way, even if I feel like the zone's constant gimmick switching could be a mixed bag. Like seriously, who designed this dumb mouse section? And also, I originally really disliked Egg Fortress for how it's basically a less interesting and less intimidating version of Eggman's usual space station bases, like the Death Egg, but the whole time backwards part of Act 2 was pretty cool, I won't lie. But yeah. I can't really say much else about these zones. It's a very mixed bag for me. And don't get me wrong, a lot of these zones are on the right track to bring back fresh Sonic environments. But I'm just left with this never ending feeling that they could have been pushed further. Because when we've constantly had to deal with recycled zones and assets as much as we have, it really made me expect a bit more for the return of Sonic games with fully original stages. It feels like the game holds back on what it could have done, and I have a theory for why that is. But we'll touch on that in another section. Overall, the game is just fine in terms of these levels by themselves. But it's when you look even deeper in this category that things start to fall downward a bit more. Because there's some decisions that I feel really hold this game back for me. For starters, why do some stages have two or three acts, but some will only have one big act? Like, it isn't bad by any means, but it's just bizarre and throws the whole structure of the game off. And occasionally that third act of a zone will be a unique act specifically themed to one of the four playable characters. And these were honestly really great ideas that I thought would have been amazing if sprinkled throughout the entire game. But no, there's only one per character for the whole game, and that really sucks. Because this was the changeup to the level formula that could have given this game more life, as these levels not only take advantage of the unique powers of Sonic and his friends decently, but they do a good job of giving a glimpse into their personalities. Except for Sonic's character act, because it was good for giving Fang another chance to shine I guess, but not really that interesting of an act to make Sonic himself stand out. But yeah, all this adds up to make the level lineup really weird and uneven, which carries over into something like the hub world, which the hub world is okay, and I'm glad we have it in some form, but it's a very static and lifeless feeling hub world. And it's also held back by how lame and not really dynamic the music is throughout it. But hoo -hoo, we will get to the music later. Before that, there's one more area of these levels I really need to bring up, but honestly, I think I'll carry it over into a different section. Now, let's cover probably one of my biggest issues with this game. Which is going to bring us into the story section. And man, do I have some spicy things to say here. Because you see, I get it. This classic styled branch of 2D Sonic isn't meant to be super heavy on story and is supposed to be a nice and tame outlet for those looking to enjoy Sonic in his most basic and pure form. But I'm sorry, this game more than any other shows exactly why that outdated mentality is just doing nothing 
for 2D Sonic. Because the fact of the matter is, there is no excuse for the story of this game to be this basic in this day and age. Especially when you're charging 60 plus dollars for the game and it is already lacking in so many other areas. And sad thing is, unlike Sonic Mania, this game actually had some decent story potential. Because it doesn't kneecap itself by mostly relying on going to past zones for zero reason or being tied to goddamn Sonic Forces. No, this is a mostly original Sonic story with some ideas that could have made for an interesting Sonic plot. But once again, it's executed in its most basic and surface level way with some major gaps that I feel didn't need to be so lacking. Basic gist is that Eggman teams up with Fang to capture the rare animals of North Star to build up his armada again. But also, he wants to capture a powerful mythical creature related to the island that he could utilize to his advantage. So upon landing on the island, Eggman and Fang run into this new character named Trip, who is a local to the island and is heavily implied to be a part of an ancient tribe that protected this island and knows many interesting secrets about it, such as the Chaos Emerald powers introduced in this game and the mythical creature Eggman is looking for. But of course, Sonic and his friends find their way to the island, so they find themselves at odds with Eggman's group. And throughout the game, you clash with Eggman and kind of clash with Fang and Trip. But in the end, Trip realizes that Fang and Eggman are using her, teams up with Sonic and Co, and our heroes manage to stop Eggman and Fang from taking over the island. And that's the end. Oh yeah, and this dragon that's probably the creature Eggman was looking for comes out of fucking nowhere and gets sealed into some random egg, but yeah, that's the story. Yeah, let's break this down. First of all, a lot of the context to this story is literally outside the game because of the fact that it's within promotional stuff such as the Sonic Superstars Trio of Trouble short or the Fang's Big Break comic panels. And honestly, I am so sick of this shit with Sonic games because it was annoying enough to see games like Sonic Forces or Sonic Frontiers suffer from this but if leaving Sonic stories half-baked in-game and putting key plot points within promotional content is going to be a new norm across the board, I truly have little faith in Sonic stories improving anytime soon, and I shouldn't have to explain why. But man, it especially ticks me off with Superstars, because it's not like the story element shown in its promotional stuff is that in-depth or complicated to not be put within the game in some form. They just didn't because of reasons. And it really nerfs down context to the bigger picture that makes everything more interesting. And even between both the in-game story stuff and promotional stuff, sometimes we just don't get context for things at all. Like, why the hell do the Chaos Emeralds now have these weird new emerald powers? Did Sega just forget about their established abilities? like how there already is a time-altering chaos power called Chaos Control and not Slow? Is there more to Trip's backstory as to why she's so cowardly at first and why she's so loyal to Fang and Eggman? What's the deal with the robots that were in Sky Temple that Eggman took and then later reused in the Cyber Station boss fight? And how the heck did he reverse time in the final act of Egg Fortress Zone and in his final boss fight? Why is Trip's super form a freaking dragon? Which, by the way, is cool, I won't lie. But what's the deal with that? And does it have to do with her people's past history? And the weird dragon that comes out of nowhere to be the final boss? Which, oh yeah, speaking of, who the hell is this random ass dragon that comes in out of nowhere as if the developers of this game ran out of time to give actual context to where it comes from? And what's the deal with this egg? that Trip uses to seal it. Like, so much of this plot just feels like an unfinished draft to a Sonic story that had some type of potential, but once again, oh freaking well, guess we'll never see that potential realized here. And that's not to say the story in-game is completely worthless, because there are some interesting things that happen, such as how we can see how Trip slowly befriends Sonic and his friends 
between how she doesn't seem to be good at being a villain anyway, how poorly Fang treats her, and the fact that she gets a nice moment with Amy, showcasing how good-natured and innocent of a character Amy is. This is all good stuff that tells a good story, even without dialogue. But man, I can't help but think how much better this story could have been if it wasn't held back with this overly simplistic mindset. And it's why I hold such a grudge against the modern form of classic Sonic. Because hyper-focusing on his retro aesthetic alone is one thing, but they don't understand that keeping his very backwards elements of game design does nothing but make the game freaking boring. Like, think about this fact. Super Mario Bros. Wonder, a Mario game with an equally as simple premise, has characters that can talk with dialogue, but a brand new Sonic game doesn't. We're at a point where Sonic is so desperate to capture that old 2D Sonic magic, the series does not get that it's putting itself behind gaming franchises that it was once ahead of in this stuff. The Genesis games had that minimalistic storytelling because it was the best they could do on Genesis for a series like Sonic. When they got the technology to give the Sonic franchise more depth, they did it. Why? Because it evolved the series and put it on par and even ahead of its competitors. Sonic didn't speak much in those old ass games because they're old. They didn't single handedly make the games better and only people obsessed with the surface level elements of those games than their actual death believe in that crap. And I'm not saying that every 2D Sonic game needs full voice acting or long cutscene sections of dialogue, especially with my mixed thoughts on the current direction of that stuff in Sonic, but there should be a better effort to tell a story in these games, whether it's 2D or 3D, because Sonic prided itself in being a pioneer to it. Whenever a Sonic game has some type of story, notice how you'll see so many videos with millions of views about either the story by itself or around people actually talking about that story, even if it's not the most high quality one. This is because storytelling is just something that naturally brings curiosity and fascination. But when your game literally has little to no story or point to say, what else is there to talk about? especially when the game is pretty uninteresting in its level design and other areas as well. Again, I want to stress that there is stuff here I like, such as how Fang gets another chance to be a major antagonist alongside Eggman, or the idea of this morally ambiguous character with Trip and her having a connection to this new environment. But otherwise, I got nothing else to praise in this camp. So on the note of characters, let's get into my dedicated character section. As you see, having multiple unique characters with solid execution will make me fall in love with a game instantly. But how did Sonic Superstars do in this camp? Well in terms of the main playable cast, we of course have Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, and Amy, and in terms of how they play, it's weird for me. As I explained, the way Sonic himself plays is mostly fine, but definitely not the best Sonic has controlled in a 2D Sonic game, with those missing moves and elements I mentioned earlier really adding on to that fact. Though I do think it's nice Sonic still has these drop dash, I guess, but the thing is everywhere now, so it's not that exciting. Tails controls how you would expect, but with Knuckles and Amy, they're a very weird mixed bag for me. Knuckles can still glide and climb walls, and it definitely is still helpful in a lot of levels, but man, does Knuckles feel so sluggish to control in this game. It feels like he moves even slower than he usually does in 2D Sonic, and it honestly makes him not too fun to use compared to everyone else, which sucks, because Knuckles is my favorite character, obviously. And Amy, is definitely close to being a solid character too, as her double jump is pretty helpful. But I feel like she could have used something else to stand her out, as she has a move similar to the drop dash, but it's just this very open and kind of weird to control hammer move, which I don't think really works out for her. 
I don't think she needed anything as busted as her being able to throw hammers like a freaking hammer bro in Sonic Origins Plus, but I would have maybe liked to see her have a standard hammer attack and something like her acrobatic hammer flip move in Sonic Advance, which would allow for her to reach high places if players can balance using it while still running, which could be tricky to utilize but really fun to use when mastered. They don't have to remove her having the spin dash of course, it can just be something that helps her stand out. Heck, I think the other three should also have a standard attack and special move that they can chain together in order to move fast while taking out enemies and platforming, like Sonic having a kick boost or special spin air dash, Tails having his tail spin attack, Knuckles getting a special punch move, etc. Stuff like this would help add something fresh to their movesets instead of being stagnant for no other reason than nostalgia. Which I know they get special moves with the extra emerald powers, but they last a short time and are mediocre. So otherwise, that leaves Knuckles and Amy as just okay to me. And in general, I feel like our main four are just okay in terms of their gameplay execution. Though they do have their moments of personality for their unique character acts, idle animations and appearing in the background every now and then when one of them isn't being used. Like I think it's cool how Tails gets to build a replica of the Eggmobile for this pretty fun new type of sky stage. And it is a bit nice we get a crumb of Knuckles showing off his treasure hunting skills by finding hidden Chaos Emeralds at a point. But that doesn't last long before Fang absolutely clowns on him. And Amy, again, gets nice moments through her friendship with Trip. So these three at least have something going on. The most boring characters in this game are probably Sonic and Eggman, which is baffling to say because they're usually some of the more lively characters of any others there. But here, Sonic just basically feels like a standard hero and Eggman feels like a standard villain. They do not have any moments that make them shine like they do in other games. And it's a shame, but it's the result of, you know, the story being basic. Ah, but you see, the true best character in this game, surprisingly, is Trip the Sun Gazer. Because she is probably one of the most busted characters ever introduced in 2D Sonic, for no reason. As she can not only double jump just like Amy, but she can cling on the walls and spin across them just like the Pink Spike Wisp. Except there is no cooldown to her abilities, she can just naturally do these things. And I think it's pretty neat, even if it is busted. She also gets her own unique super form that allows her to fly around and breathe fire as a dragon. But sadly the control for her super form is kind of garbage, as it feels really unfinished and sluggish. But that aside, I like playing as Trip. She has probably the best new Sonic character design in ages. In her story arc of slowly learning to break off from Eggman's group and joining Sonic's group has a nice simple vibe to it. It feels genuine and not artificial or snarky. And we even get an entire unique campaign themed around her after beating the main story, which you think would be a bigger positive. Here's the problem though. Trip's story, what basically acts as the second campaign of this game, is a sort of hard mode for this game. And the level design for her stages is absolutely brutal. And at first I thought this seemed a bit logical because as I explained earlier, Trip does break the main story levels pretty badly and having harder levels that take advantage of her abilities isn't a bad idea in theory. But the problem is that some of the level design in her stages is just absolute garbage to slug through. Because instead of having actual well designed challenge, they just make certain parts of the game more annoying by adding things like an overuse of death pits, enemies that can jump from nowhere or attack you from where you can't hit them, and a lot of other trial and error BS that you'll need to tolerate rather than enjoy. And that's not to say there's anything wrong with more difficult level design or any of the things I just listed, it's just that the way it's handled in Trip's story is done with a sense of unprofessional nuance. 
Levels in her campaign make me feel like I'm playing a poorly designed Mario Maker level as opposed to a well designed official Sonic level and I almost never want to play it in full again. But sadly, I had to beat it because the game requires you to do that in order to get the final story, which just kind of felt weird to me. Like, this isn't anything new entirely. Knuckles' story in Sonic 3 and Knuckles is similar to this, and this model is just like how the stories work in a game like Sonic Rush, where you play Sonic story first, then Blazes, and then play through a final boss story mode there. So I almost wouldn't really mind it and mark it as padding as a lot of other people would, but the lack of differences in Trip's story campaign, besides the annoying difficulty bump, don't really justify it as some required story mode to beat in order to get a final story. As to me, one of the best things about multiple story modes in Sonic is when we get to see the unique perspectives of the characters within that story route. Trip's story could have been a chance to, you know, actually explore Trip's story, giving us pieces to her backstory and mindset throughout the main story as we play through her version of these levels. But because we're mostly just running through badly tweaked versions of the same levels with nothing really new of story substance, it makes it feel more boring than it could have been. And it's a shame, since I do like Trip as a character, but man, did she deserve a less dry game to debut in. Guess that leaves what's left on the villain side, and again, there's not much to talk about here. I really want to be happy that Fang is back in a major way, but honestly, it felt like the game didn't really use him as much as it could have. Not helped by the fact that he has some of the most annoying sections in this game. It almost makes me want to never see his face again, but I just want him to get another chance in a better game as well. And as I said before, that final boss is an absolute nothing character. Like, Sonic characters that exist solely to be the big threat isn't a new thing by itself, but there's at least some type of buildup or an explanation to what the deal with them is. And this creature is so dry, it doesn't even get a name displayed for it. It just shows up to be clowned on and sealed away before it can make any sort of impression. Which on that note, what even is its name? Hold on. Black Dragon? Are you serious? <laughs> but yeah, that's it for this game's characters. So, wait, the fuck is that? Is that the end from Sonic Frontiers? The final boss of Sonic Frontiers? That's apparently supposed to be some planet-eating monster or something? The hell is that thing doing here in this game? Was it just above Sonic's world this whole time unnoticed? Did it really sit there and not eat Sonic's planet somehow throughout this entire game that takes place in the past, presumably? Ugh, what even is this franchise canon at this point, man? But now it's time to break down some of the true worst parts about this game, and what I think truly holds it back from being a really good Sonic game. Starting with the bosses. And oh my god. These bosses, bro. I don't even know what I can say about them. Other than that, these bosses are some of the worst ones I've had to deal with in a video game in a long while. Because all of the bosses suffer from a series of key issues that persist throughout the whole game that could have been easily avoided. Being that their attack patterns take too long to wait through, and you have very little room to do damage to them. Since the bosses only allow for one hit at a time, it will make you cycle through multiple minutes of attack cycles if you don't attack them while you can. Like, I do appreciate the fact that the bosses have some actual attack design to them, and some of them do have some interesting gimmicks and moves behind them, but they can really overstay their welcome and make the game feel more like a chore than it should have been. And there are just too many of these types of bosses, and sometimes I think an act really does not need to end in one, as I just want to breeze through a level with pure speed, 
and move on already. Like, sprinkle in a mini boss every now and then, sure, but either keep big boss showdowns to the end of a last act to a world, or dedicate one act to them, please. Cause again, I'm not saying that they need to cut down on bosses across the board and only have a handful of them like in Super Mario Bros. Wonder, god no. I'm just saying that they really need to tone down on the bosses dragging on in their fights next game. Because I never want to fight some of these guys again, especially the final bosses. Oh my god, the final bosses. They all just suck, and I don't understand why they had to. The Egg Emperor, I think it's called, is basically yet another freaking Death Egg robot that yes, isn't the exact same in design and the way it fights, but it's still just lame and not fun to go up against at all. Not helped by the fact that if you die in this fight, you have to do it all over again, and that is just a drag. This game just suddenly forgets checkpoints and it's freaking brain dead. Thank god this game at least has the sense to not have limited lives to balance it out, or else whew, I would have exploded. And don't get me started on this annoying ass fang mech fight and the actual final boss of this game, as I think those bosses are just straight up cheap. Between how the fang robot has this attack that can destroy half the damn stage with no warning, or how the true final boss heavily depends on rings, yet it feels like you're barely given enough rings to survive and can deplete them all easily if you dare use the dash attack. Like. All of this just really makes the game end on a low note for me, which is especially not helped by how the story around these finales is non-existent and basic. The most positive thing I can say is that I at least think the fang mech and concept looks cool, and I like how it was foreshadowed more than the actual true final boss. And also, um, shout out to the cyber station fight, I think that one is cool just solely because of the fact that the robots can take the form of your customized battle mode robot. But sadly I didn't even witness this on my first run since it's not really explained to you, so I just fought the basic robots and it was kinda lame. So yeah, the bosses suck in this game. Thank god that you can play the stage acts without them through time attack because it does save this game from absolutely tanking and raiding for me. But it's still sad that I would rather not play the main story modes because of how bad these bosses are. Another area of this game that was painfully disappointing is the music of the game. As this game has probably one of the most frustrating mixed bags for a Sonic OST I have ever heard. And I think most fans know the issue. T Lopes returned for this game, and the tracks that he had a hand on were really good, and we even had some solid tracks from some other artists too. But persisting throughout the entire soundtrack is Jun Sonoi heavily reusing that trash Genesis wannabe sound font from Sonic 4. And it just tanks the entire OST, and I don't understand why it had to. Like, I don't want to be too harsh on Jun, because he did make multiple of the melodies for these tracks, including the ones that I really do like. And he is a legendary composer when it comes to his guitar work, so I have infinite respect for him. But I'm sorry, June, or whoever keeps handing him the keys to make tracks like this, that Sonic Force sound font is garbage, and it is not making it out of North Star. Keep it locked away forever, and either improve your sound, or respectfully, Please stick to guitar work. I know Sega doesn't like the idea of too much Sonic Adventure style rock in the precious classic style 2D Sonic games, but with how all over the place this soundtrack is, at this point, that really does not matter. I would rather have an inconsistent OST that is good across the board than an inconsistent OST that is held down by how much it's trying to appeal to 16-bit nostalgia. Alright, with that tangent done, that's gonna bring us to multiplayer. And I'm going to keep this one short and sweet for y'all. The multiplayer of this game 
is not really good, which I can especially confirm after doing a second playthrough with some friends dedicated to it. And I'm going to boil it down to two main reasons. First of all, this game's multiplayer is honestly fairly functional at times because of how the game collapses while trying to run it within some of the levels, showing that it clearly needed more time in the oven. But Sega wouldn't dare allow that, because they gotta make those holiday sales after all. But that jab aside, I also just think that it was a poor idea from the start, because Sonic is not really meant for same screen co-op multiplayer, unless the levels are specifically built around it and Sonic and Co are slowed down significantly. Remember how I said that I felt like this game was held back in places when it came to its level design? Well, most likely, it was because of the multiplayer. But weirdly, most of the levels are still not really great for multiplayer because Sonic level design is naturally very solo focused due to how fast the gameplay for Sonic is. Sonic is not like Mario, where the focus is on slower and careful platform jumping. Sonic has very fast paced level design, and unless you drastically tone that down to accommodate up to four people running around, it just does not work. Does that mean I think Sega should never try multiplayer in a mainline Sonic game again? Not necessarily, as I do think there is fun to be had, like with the multiplayer in a game like Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. But A, the multiplayer has to be split screen and needs to have a separate mode dedicated to it. And B, it needs to be far more polished and refined than here, or else it's just not even worth bothering to play. I just think this game's multiplayer from the start came from a very badly timed and poorly executed mentality. Because not only is Sega extremely late to writing off the success of the new Super Mario Bros. series and its multiplayer, but the multiplayer is not remotely as fun to play than the average campaign. So in the end, one of the biggest things that this game was peddling falls flat, and it wasn't worth it in the grand scheme of the whole game. Oh, and in case anyone tries to deny Sega was trying to copy the new Super Mario Bros. games, they straight up say it themselves. Which brings us to the last section of this video, the bonus section where I tackle any last few tidbits about the game that I actually feel like talking about. And the only other thing I can think to mention here is these special stages and what you can earn within them. Because when it comes to just completing the main story, these special stages you'll want to track down are in these giant rings, similar to the ones in games like Sonic 3 and & Knuckles and Sonic Mania. And in these stages, you'll go through a new type of special stage challenge that isn't too bad at first, and can actually be kind of fun, single player at least. But as you get to the later variants of the stages to unlock the last few emeralds, it kind of becomes a mess to play, as the general control for these stages can get really finicky, and missing one dot in this weird void world can lead to instant death basically. It's also annoying because you can't just grind one special stage ring like in Sonic Mania, you have to hunt a unique one every time, which again, makes me wish I were just playing Mania instead, but it probably is better for game design balance. But yeah, the special stages of this game aren't bad and more tolerable than some past versions, but Mania's special stages are still king, because those had a very fun and original concept that just fit the traditional Sonic gameplay better. But I guess on the subject of other special stage types, if you do collect the 50 rings and hop into the sparkling ring near the checkpoint post, you can do a set of special stages themed after the original ones in Sonic the Hedgehog 1, which I don't know who keeps bringing back these trash special stage types, but at least it's optional this time. But what do you get out of these special stages when you aren't hunting emeralds? Metals. And medals basically act as a new form of currency of this game that is tied to so many new pieces of it. It's the whole point of the weird fruit acts that you can play. You can find hidden golden enemies that gives you more of them, etc. Like, 
While I do appreciate the encouragement to explore levels and play spell stages in order to get even more of them, all it amounts to being currency for is the skin's multiplayer battle mode, as you can unlock some pretty neat skins and cosmetics for the robot avatars you do in that mode, but honestly, the battle mode of this game is extremely boring and a waste of time, so in the end, it just wastes all this currency and these cool skins for nothing. And how they could have avoided this is by tying the medals to not just unlocking skins and cosmetics for these robot avatars you might not even bother with, but costumes and cosmetics for the playable characters in the main story modes, as that would motivate me to grind out these medals far more than a mediocre battle mode. Which by the way, some of these medal prices are insane, because expecting me to play the game this much for how little content it has is laughable. But hey, it could be worse. Sega could be continuing to lock skins behind pointless DLC. <coughs> but I think I've said all I've needed to with this category. So now, we arrive at the summary and final verdict. And I'm just going to get to the point on this one. Basically, this is a Sonic game that just kind of exists for me. Because it's far from being a bad game, especially when compared to some other 2D and non-2D Sonic games, but it's undeniably a step back in so many areas that Sonic Mania, the previous 2D installment, and so many other 2D Sonic options did far better in. So it's basically like Sonic Forces again, where there is very little reason to revisit it because there's better games that you can play. And I can't really say if I can fully recommend it, especially not for 60 freaking dollars. God, no, oh, that pricing was just straight robbery. But like, I could at least look on the bright side and say that this is a nice step in the right direction, but in a lot of ways, that's objectively wrong. Because this game is a half step in the right direction but is another decline technically that we only really put up with because we're just grateful that Sega didn't give us a game on par with Sonic 4 Episode 1 again. So a part of me really wants to rate this game in the D tier range like Sonic Forces, but the enjoyment I got out of those first few bits of the main story playthrough are enough to barely keep it out of there, at least for me. But best believe that while this is getting a C rating for me, it is a very low C grade. So the final rating comes out at a C minus, a 72 out of 100 if I have to put a number on it. So I guess now that I've broken down this game in full, I can finally talk about what I think the future of 2D Sonic is going to be and what I think it should be. And given that this game underdelivered even for Sega's expectations, I think even they realized that this game was very underwhelming for a lot of people, and also, it was stupid as hell to put it so close next to two games that are far superior to it. Like, Sega needs to understand that not only is their blind obsession to rushing out Sonic games for that holiday period hurting them due to making rash decisions, but it really shows that Sonic needs to improve in quality if he's actually going to be comparable to other franchises. Because it's so clear that this game was undercooked in a lot of areas and could have been far better. Not to say the game was a complete broken disaster, but it's undercooked to the point to where the game is just not fun to play. And at the end of the day, failing in that department set this game up for nothing but disappointment. And it at least could have been excused more if this game had anything else of value to it that made it worthwhile, but as I explained, the game's theming, story, and other areas are so dry. There was nothing else to discuss. If you want a game with an eventful story, play Spider-Man 2. If you want a game with really polished gameplay, play Mario Wonder. Sonic Superstars has little to offer in those categories, or any of the other ones, so I hope the effect that this game leads to is Sega actually utilizing the time they have to work on these games to put out something worthwhile. But more than that, 
the bigger effect that I pray this game leads to is that I hope it finally retires Classic Sonic for a good long time. Because I think another factor to this game not doing so hot is that the hype for Classic Sonic nostalgia is just finally dry for people. Which took y'all fucking long enough. But seriously, with how well Sonic Frontiers performed in comparison, I think that it is definitive proof that modern Sonic does not need to rely on Classic Sonic to survive, and Sonic can do well with risky shakeups with his formula if they're just done so with decent execution. Which, granted, I clearly don't think Sonic Frontiers was exactly perfect in what it set out to do either, but at least there was actually stuff to talk about with Frontiers. Sonic Superstars being a very basic and dry 2D Sonic platformer that didn't succeed off nostalgia alone should be a wake up call that the hype for the whoa retro Sonic is finally drained. It was draining for ages now and when even the latest 2D Mario is going out its way to shake up the formula but Sonic is the one who is insistent on being stagnant it is a sign that things need to change. I want a full return to modern styled 2D Sonic. Sure, maybe attempt a multiplayer focused Sonic again, or have your small callbacks here and there if they aren't overused between more than a handful of games, but stop over relying on trying to be similar to new Super Mario Bros and come up with ideas fitting to Sonic that are new and exciting. And that's all I've got left to say without repeating myself for the millionth time. I know it sounds like I'm really dragging the hell out of this game and absolutely hated it, but really, I just see it as mediocre and unnoteworthy. And if this were a one-time case with Sonic being mediocre every few games or so, knowing he could improve in the future or in another branch of Sonic, sure, I'd be fine. But in terms of how I feel about Sonic on a bigger scale, whew, I'm noticing a bit of a pattern. As throughout the 2020s, it feels like not many of Sonic's games or multimedia projects have risen above being mediocre for me. And I don't even want to get into the whole rabbit hole of arguing that case right now and breaking down how I feel with everything Sonic has done in the 2020s so far, but I just had to say it here. Because if nothing changes going into 2025, the halfway point of this decade, I'm going to have a lot more to say. But hey, if we're talking Sega overall, things aren't completely hopeless, since we have games like Jet Set Radio 3 on the way at last, and that crumb gives me hope that Sega as a company can improve. So maybe, just maybe, Sonic can rise out this weird phase he's in, and I can have something worth talking about again. And I can't stress enough that I'm glad Sonic isn't putting out another bad product, I guess. But he could be so much more than this, man. But until I see proof of that, I think I've said all I've needed to for this video. If you've made it to this point of the video, thank you for watching all the way until the end. What are your thoughts on Sonic Superstars? Was there anything I didn't cover that I should comment on? And what do you want to see happen for Sonic's next 2D installment? Let me know in the comments below. This has been Nux, and I'm out. Peace.